So I'd like to get a sense of who I'm talking to today. So does, has anybody here never had a job in tech? There are at least a couple of people. Uh, OK. Uh, how about anybody, whether or not you've had a job in tech, who is not a programmer? OK. And is anybody not directly involved in any way with open source development? So same, OK. And how many people here understand the difference between sort of the philosophical sides of things between free software and open source software as sort of political ideas. How many do understand that distinction somewhat? You're aware of it. <laughs> OK. So at one point, of course, I didn't know much about these things. But I'll tell you a little bit about me and my background. And I, I'm turning into something of more of a technical person over time. but I got involved before I otherwise had any interest or knowledge about these things. So I have, in fact, had one tech job. Uh, about 15 years ago, I was employed at the mostly Macintosh running student computer lab at my university, where I helped people figure out how to do things like print and save their file to their disk. And that was the only technical job I've ever had. Uh, I ended up getting a music degree. And I teach music lessons for a living. And when I look back on how that happened and how that worked, it's, there are some regrets that I have. But I wanted to share some of the biases that I had in my experience that relate to other experiences people would have who are not already insiders to this sort of community. So back when I was working at the computer lab, I remember this partly because I told the story to other people. And, you know, when you tell stories, it reiterates in your brain. So this is not the absolute thing. But the narrative, as I remember it, is I was sitting in the computer lab, and I was not all that friendly with the other guys in the, who worked in the lab, because I was not really a computer person. They were talking computer tech stuff all the time. And I was mostly off doing other things. But I was sort of knew them a little bit. And one day, some of them came up and said, hey, uh, you guys want to play cards, euchre or something? There's like nobody in the lab right now. We can just hang out a little bit. And I remember saying, yeah, that sounds like fun. I happen to have a deck of cards in my backpack. I'll go grab my backpack from the like, shelf over in the other way. And I walked over. And then I turned around, and they were all gone. And I was like, where'd they go? And then I started wandering on the lab, and I found them sitting in different computers, all logged into Yahoo, not in visual contact with each other, because they had the things between the computers. And they had all logged into Yahoo. And that's how they played cards, even though they're all in the same space. And I remember feeling like, I don't really want to have anything to do with these people. <laughs> I would like to go outside. I would like to be social. I don't really like staring at a computer all day. And the university had a computer requirement to take computer class. And I was basically saying, there's, there's proof that I know enough about computers because I got a job working in the computer lab. I can help people save files and print. And I know how to use a computer. I don't want to waste my time with this. So I took the stupidest waste of time class that people called Computers for Trees, which was like how to save files and how to make a website using a template thing that you don't do any programming, and how to use Microsoft Word. And it was a complete waste of my time. And I didn't learn any valuable skills at all. And years later, I'm sort of like, I could have learned some programming skills. That would have been useful. But I was that much of somebody who was not interested in self-identifying as a tech programmer, geek, computer person, even though I knew my way around computers. So I will not go into it today, because it's a whole other story. But I ended up getting into what's sort of the free, free culture movement and issues around copyright. And that relates more to being a musician and the issues with music teaching and educational materials. And that's a whole other talk. But that's actually what, in the end, sort of brought me back to understanding some of free software over time. Uh, but at any rate, the first program that really got me into being using computers, this goes back to before I had that job, um, just as a computer user, was this program called Encore that worked on my old Mac in the 90s. And I used it to compose music. And that's what was, I was most excited about. And in those days, I, as a non-programmer, didn't really associate this with anything different from buying a guitar or something. It's just a product. And 
you, you, know, you get the thing on some physical disk, and it's in this box in the store. And it worked out that I got a discount because I got last year's edition. And it was like way cheaper, so I could afford it. Instead of the like $200, it was like $20 for version 2, because the new one is version 4. And I was like, that's just like buying the old model car or the old bike. You know, I just got a discount because I got the old version. And one interesting thing to think about this is that in hindsight, of course, that's ludicrous in the sense that this model is, you know, what good does it do for me to use old software? Just because, like, it's not like it helps anybody in any sense except the business model of the way the software was delivered. So even today, most people think of things this way. You think of software as this product, and there's tons of analogies where everybody relates to it as there is this thing, it's done, you get it, and that's it. Of course, with the web and the internet and everybody's you know, seeing all the updates all the time, it's a little bit different. But there's still this consumer relationship to the software. So what happened is Passport Designs that makes that program that I used so much went out of business. And the computer I got after that didn't run the old software. And I was kind of flailing around and not sure what to do because I didn't like the other thing, which was this program called Finale, which is still around, which is really screwy because it has like a million different tools for every function instead of the other one, which is really easy to use. And it kind of was really frustrating. And my overall feeling was I feel very alienated and very sort of uncomfortable that I was relying on this product and somehow random things that don't have anything to do with the actual development or me, just sort of the thing disappears. And there's nothing I can do about it. And it was bought by a company called GVox, which spent some number of years trying to continue charging $500 for software and doing nothing with it, essentially. And over like 15 years, they updated a little bit, so at least it would run, but it's not even updated. And they still charge $500 for it. And in frustration, looking for other alternatives, eventually, and this is, again, like 15 years later, I found this program called MuseScore. And it's free software. It doesn't cost me anything. And it's built by the community. And how could this be? And it's licensed under the GPL, so everybody can use it. And as a music teacher, I was thinking, wow, this is actually relatively easy to use. It's like the program I was using. I could actually recommend this to my students. And it could do all these things. But even still, 15 years later, this program was not quite as good as the 15-year-old program I had been using. And it was certainly not as good as the commercial expensive things, which had their own problems. But if I was locked into the, using those, then they could be taken away at any point, or who knows what would happen. But I got really excited about the possibilities, that we could have software that would be reliable, that the community would build. And if one person, you know, no particular one person could just take it away, or something that would just end up dying, because the community is a bunch of people all around the world contributing. There's other programs, by the way, like Audacity that I really like. And at the same time, I was getting into organizing and trying to deal with a lot of personal things. And I found this program that's a proprietary program called Things, which is a beautiful UI and runs on Mac and is really easy to use in certain ways. And I was an early purchaser of this. I paid $50 for a license. And I remember contacting them and saying, I love this. Your software is so easy to use. And it's got this great UI. And it's helped me organize things in my life. And I just wish you had a few features. Maybe I'm looking forward to adding these things. Uh, like prerequisites. When the software, uh, when, when there's a task that I want done and I can't do it until this other one is done, just don't show it to me until I check off the first task. It was very obvious to me. And I waited and waited and waited, and about four years went by, and the only thing they did is they built CloudSync. And <laughs> they didn't do any of the features that anybody was requesting, but they still had a nice UI. Uh, and at that point, I was getting really frustrated with Apple Computer because they had come up with this iPhone and the i things. And my experience was initially, these devices are amazing. They're really easy to use. They're inexpensive relative to other computers. I could see my students starting to use them. And this is going to enable so many people to do all sorts of things. What if I could have MuseScore and Audacity and these other programs that I found uh, running on iOS? And that's when I found out that Apple censors those things from running on the iPhone or anything. So MuseScore made a proprietary uh, reader app for iOS, but it's GPL. And Apple's terms say, you're not allowed to share anything. You're not allowed to modify anything if you get it through the App Store. 
And that means you can't have something that's GPL that says you can modify things and you can share things. So the result is there is no Muse score for iOS. Instead, there's proprietary stuff, which, again, is unreliable. I don't know what's going to happen. Some company goes away. If I recommend it to students, they're going to be shown a bunch of ads or they're going to have to pay something, and I don't know if they're going to use it. And I don't get this idea of there's a community of people who are building this, which is not something I understood like in anything more than the abstract. But I remember my main experience with this was when I had a student who's this eight-year-old guitar student of mine who was playing with his iPod Touch before his lesson. And he said, uh, well, I came up to him and I said, what are you playing? What are you doing? Uh, just curious. And he said, oh, I'm playing solitaire. And he showed me, and it looked exactly like DOS solitaire from 1984 or something. Like, it's just solitaire. What else can it look like? And so I was like, OK, solitaire. Um, and he was like, oh, yeah, but it has these special features. You see, if I get stuck, I can pay with virtual coins that I buy with real money to get, to get out of being stuck in solitaire. And so he was paying his like, allowance to this app developer to cheat at solitaire, which you could, of course, <laughs> do with cards. And, and then I looked at it, and there's like a thing at the bottom saying, like, he should go eat at McDonald's. And so I was like, oh my god, this is where the world's going. Like, everything is locked down, and I can't rely on it. And, it's gonna, and there's like a million versions of everything, and this is just ways to like, and it's all censored, and I can't get Muse score on this. And this is the computer systems everybody's going to be running. And so I was pretty freaked out about it. And then Apple announced that they were going to have the Mac App Store. And so I was, so around, this is version whatever, 10.6.8. And it was like, the next version forcibly added the Mac App Store, whether you liked it or not. And then there was Gatekeeper, which meant that if I told students to get this open source program that I found that was really great, that the Apple computer they were using would say, warning, and make them scared, and they wouldn't install it because it didn't go through the Mac App Store. And eventually, of course, I worry that Apple will become, it'll all be speaking to guy, a giant iPhone. And then I'll be back to this situation where the software that I want to run or the software that I want to be able to have available in the community that actually doesn't have shitty ads or other things that I don't like uh, is just going to be wiped out because powerful interests have a different sort of say about how this is going to go. Now, it doesn't always work out that badly, but I ended up deciding to see what I could do with a GNU Linux system. And at the time, I, my wife was in grad school, and I had foregone another grad school opportunity I had in another place so that we'd stay together. And she had paid for a license for a proprietary science program that she was using in her master's degree. And what happened is she tried to get the thing to install on this extra Windows laptop we got just to use it. And the DRM stuff for installing wouldn't let her install it. And she spent like two or three days on the tech support trying to figure out what to do. And eventually, she gave up and said that she just used it on campus because she couldn't even get the thing to work. And we had this extra computer. So I decided to try installing a Linux system and see, could I possibly use this? And would this be usable not just for me, but for my students? Could this be something that we as a society could actually use so that we wouldn't end up in a situation in which everything is constantly tracking us and putting ads on everything and blocking software that we all try to build together. So the truth is, it was extremely hard. I ended up finding some forum like this Linux Musicians Forum and talking with people, and they said, you should use all these various commands in the terminal, which were totally baffling to me. And I was like, if you have to do this, this I don't know how anybody can make sense of this. And I was saying, you know, CD, this and this. And I was like, I know what that is. Like, that means you, you load the compact disk that you put in your computer, right? I really did not know what I was doing at all. But what happened that was interesting to me is that total strangers kept sending me new messages over days and days and days saying, wait, have you tried this? Until like I, like, I think I actually decided to give up probably four or five times. Like, I couldn't get the audio to work, because if you know anything about Linux audio, there's Alsa and Pulse Audio and Jack. And there's the separate thing for Firewire. And it's totally crazy. And you have to do different things with. And I ended up, I remember going through somebody instructing me that I should adjust things about my threading priorities. <laughs> and, and, and I, because I was having like X runs which relate to latency things. And so 
I ended up trying to change some file because somebody said that this related to the threading, and then something in my system stopped working, and then I was told, oh, you used sudo to change something in a file in the system, and really, you just need to reinstall everything. And like, that's the type of experience that I'm having. And this is not that long ago. This is 2012. And that was the first time I was doing any of this. But at some point, I actually got it working. And the guy who actually makes the system that I'm actually still running, which is called KX Studio, is this guy who lives in Portugal. And as far as I was concerned on the forum, he was amazing. Not only did he seem to know everything about Linux, but there were other people who kept having like arguments about stupid, petty things. And he always would come in and say something reasonable. And he was like super nice. And everybody would sort of be like, oh, well, you know what you're talking about. We'll just trust you, OK. And like he would deal with these issues in the community. Uh, and I didn't really know who this person was. And it was just amazing that this even existed. But I remember talking to this other developer who was making a synthesizer plugin. And I said, hey, I've always wanted to have this particular feature that relates to tuning functions in synthesizers. Maybe you could add that. And what happened was, like six hours later, he was like, OK, I added it. And I was like, what? I spent like years like begging these proprietary software companies, like, would they just respond to me, please? Like, I just want your software to do this one thing. And this guy just did it like immediately. And then he was like, yeah, just load the thing and compile the software, and then you can test it and tell me how it works. And I was like, compile the software. I'm like, what? How do I do that? I don't know what to do. And, and at the same time, I was trying to talk to people on the forums, and it turned out that the other software that seemed really exciting, like we were really going to finally get a great system that I could use with my students. Uh, I'm not going to go into names here, but there was a developer who was talking about this, and then other people on the forum were all saying, like, you're full of crap. I don't think you're, th you're you have these big dreams, and you're going to do this stuff. You're just a phony, and you're whatever. And they were giving him a bunch of shit about what he was trying to do. And I was trying to say, like, hey, like, I'm really excited about this. I hope it happens. Like, can you guys not be so, so obnoxious, basically? But I was trying to, like, mediate and talk to people. And like, I remember just being a bit stressed out about this. Like, there's this community, and they're doing all these things that's so promising, but like, everybody's fighting, and it's crazy. So what happened is, about two weeks later, I finally got up the courage to figure out how to compile this guy's software who would like made the feature I wanted. And then I posted a thing and said, OK, like, I tested it, but I didn't see it. It didn't, like, it didn't seem to work at all. And he said, what do you mean? I like, did that two weeks ago, and you wasted all your time arguing with those stupid jerks on the forum, and like, now I've, it's two weeks later, I've done all these other patches and all this stuff, and like, don't ever ask me to help you again. I'll never listen to you. Go the hell away. So that was not a great experience. And again, I almost gave up. And that's the type of experience that some people have coming into open source software. I don't know if any of you have had things like that, but you can get perspective on that, or if you're people who are the developers, and you're trying to relate to what experiences people have. Uh, but the other side of it is that this guy who is the really friendly guy who's in Portugal, turns out that I had pinged him and asked him something like, I would like to figure out how to like, help you or donate or something, but I don't even know. There's like a million projects, and you're packaging all this stuff. And if I donate to you, like, will you figure out who else deserves to get funded or how this is going to work? Like, I feel weird. Like, all these people are helping me, and I didn't do anything even. Like, I, didn't, I didn't contribute anything. And he just said, yeah, actually, if you just donate to me, I'll probably just use it to buy groceries, because I live with my grandmother in Portugal, and I'm unemployed, and I don't really have any income at all. I'm poor. And he's like the guy who makes my computer system. And, and then he was like, yeah, you should come chat in IRC sometime. And I didn't know what that was. But he'd set up the system so that if I opened this program, it would automatically load his IRC channel. And then I loaded the thing up. And he was like, hey, WolfTune, what are you doing? How's it going? And like, I was chatting with this guy. And to me, that was bizarre. Like, <laughs> he knew who I was. Like, I was this guy on the forum. And there's this guy in Portugal. And he like, knows me, because I use his system. And it's just crazy. So my overall impression about this whole situation is that there's all these people all trying to do different things. And it's, it's messy. They're not coordinating very well. And you have this situation in which everybody thinks that they have the answer to everything, so they're going to do it their way. And so basically, 
I was trying to think about how I could, what I could do about this or how I could help or, because I don't feel like I trust Apple anymore and I don't feel like this is really gonna work because I'm not sure, but I, but I wanna believe that it's gonna work. And so at the same time, I was getting comfortable enough with my system that I decided I was going to try to make it work like entirely and try to leave Apple, which was very, very hard. And I searched around for organizing programs like that program Things that I had. And the closest I found is this program called Task Coach. And as you can see, it doesn't look like the other one at all. In fact, it's made with WX widgets, which means it's cross-platform and certain things, but it's kind of ugly and confusing. But when I actually looked at it deeper, I was like, it has prerequisites. And it has time tracking where you can actually have it send reminders at different times. You can actually uh, set different tags with different categories, and you can have it tell you when you're late on something, which is different from being due. Like due is when you actually have to do this thing by a certain time, but late is like you meant to start it at this time and you haven't started it yet. And it's actually really powerful, although it's a bit ugly. And I was, it was just crazy. How is there this program that actually did everything I wanted it to do almost? And how could I get other people to use this? And maybe if everybody chipped in together, or we got the same, all the people who are supporting the proprietary thing to support this, it would be great. And so I contacted the developers and said, hey, I really like your thing. It actually has all this stuff, but how can I help make it better, or make the thing better? Can I donate some money? I paid $50 for the other license. And they said, well, we're just people who have day jobs, and we do this in our spare time and you know, for fun or something. And if you send us $25 or something, it's like nice. We, it makes us feel good. But, doesn't really change anything. And <laughs> yeah, so, so I just sort of said, well, I don't know. Uh, I, I noticed that you have all these requests, and like, there's got to be some way we can do something. But maybe we could run a campaign or something where I could tell all the like, other 10,000 people who use this program that it, I would chip in like a little bit for every one of them who would come help with me. And they said, oh, that sounds interesting. I don't know how we do that. But what we could do is, if you really want to help, I noticed that you were looking at all of our feature requests, and there's like 700 of them. And uh, you could help by like, sorting them or get rid getting rid of the duplicates or something. And at the time, I was thinking about going to grad school. And I was stressed out and procrastinating a little bit. So I started into looking at their feature requests. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And I was hoping the program would be better, and I wanted to help them make it better because I was using it. And so I started doing that a bunch, and then they said, hey, that's really helpful. You're like, actually, this is really useful stuff. Uh, would you like to be the third member of the task coach development team? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I hemmed and hawed for a while, and then I sort of said, OK, I, I guess. OK, I'll, I'll try that. And, and I am now the third. I am one of the developers of this program, Task Coach. And it's a great program, and it's still made very little progress because it's hard. And I can go into that. But I'm not the only one who wants this to be better. So there was some other people, this uh, guy in Russia and somebody else, who proposed that we run a campaign. And uh, I'm going to skip this for a second. He decided that we'd do a crowdfunding campaign to support the idea of one of the most popular feature requests, which was rearrange columns with drag and drop, which is a pretty pathetic little thing to do. Uh, and I was like, I can't, I was gonna, who's going to be excited about that? But I think this is how like, developers think. They're like, this is what we need to do. We're going to rearrange the columns with drag and drop. Well, I know that WX Widgets has a problem with that, so we have to get a WX Widgets developer to fix the underlying library so that we can do this feature. And they were going to ask like $2,500 for drag and drop your columns. And, and I was not optimistic that this would work. But we got about five, they got $500 of people donating. Uh, didn't count because it was like a threshold model. But 500 people, $500 was donated or pledged on, almost entirely on the premise of, I don't really care that much about this feature, but I like your software so much, I just feel I should donate and support you. Uh, but that didn't work. So essentially, the, we have this issue of, how to get other people involved with this type of thing and how to build this community. Uh, one of the things that I started doing was telling my students about these things and trying to get, I actually got my students to start using Linux, which was a crazy experiment. And I will tell you, it was even harder than 
Like I had documented all the things that had worked for me and I thought I could make it happen. And it was, that's a whole other story I could get into if you want to talk to me about the details. But it, we're not in a situation in which it's easy to do things once you get past the very surface level of I can open a web browser. If you're getting into doing something like audio work in Linux, uh, the idea that that's accessible to most people is a, a long, far away future today, still, despite the programs being very powerful. And so we still are stuck with this world in which the main things that everybody has as day jobs and the main things that fund everything are when you artificially restrict everything. And we end up with, as we go, the I things keep doing more and more amazing things. And I still don't trust them and I'm still uncomfortable with it. So I had a friend who I was talking to about all of this and complaining about how ironic it is that we have a huge community of people who are all wanting to build open source software and you have all the technology that Apple is doing which in principle there's obviously funding for. Like Apple has funding, the, the resources exist in the world. Why do we have to get it under these awful terms? And so it happens that this friend of mine was a developer and he said, oh, well that idea you have about you'd like to chip in if other people would chip in, that's a good idea. I should, I'll make a website for you and you can write it up and we'll make it. And we can have this thing where like the number of people who chip in, you know, you don't have to take the risk because if Somebody else will chip in, you know, we'll all work together and we fund the software and it makes a quadratic funding effect. And I was very, very hesitant to get into this because I thought it was going to be an extremely hard, big, long, complicated thing to do. But I was procrastinating about going into grad school, so I thought if we made this website, which we decided to build, and it's called snowdrift.coop, and I've been working on for coming on three years now, uh, you know, I figured that if I could get all of the people in the world to work together better to actually fund free software and free culture uh, using this thing, then I could get really all that help I need for Task Coach. And then Task Coach could be a better organizing thing, and I could use it so I could actually organize my grad school apps better so I could finally go to grad school, <laughs> and then I could... And then I could go and get the, make the musical compositions I really wanted to make after I study stuff and get a PhD. And <laughs> so I don't actually expect at this point that I'll ever go to grad school. Um, but this actually matters to me more than what I think I would have done if I got a musicology PhD, although I liked the folks that I met in that system that I have a whole bunch of complaints about academia. That's a whole other story. <laughs> um, so the issue is we're trying to build a system now in which my feeling about this is that I still identify as a non-programmer, non-technical sort of person. What happened, of course, is that David, my friend who started this with me, said, you know, you should help with the code sum, and you should read this book on Haskell or something, and then you can <laughs> do a little bit of you know, tweaking the code here and there. And he had to keep pushing me to do it, but he's the very nice sort of guy and he likes teaching other people. And so I have actually been doing some programming a little bit. But my feeling is that the whole nature of this is we need a system where we're actually building the thing to serve the needs of the people who are actually the users at the end of the day. Which is to say we need the same stuff that people who build proprietary stuff with the idea of it being useful for an end user, but it needs to be something where they're involved in the open source process. And this is hard, but we decided to build a system where we have like a nice code of conduct and run it all cooperatively and emphasize the values of the community stuff that we're doing because we, I saw all the problems with people arguing about stuff and having all the issues in the community and all the disparate things. And the funding mechanism that we have is a consensus building machine. By having everybody say, I oh, will chip in when everybody else chips in, we can potentially all work together to fund like one thing, because I really want everybody to work on MuseScore, because as it works out, there's somebody else who started yet another thing that would be like MuseScore, and then a year later gave up on it because he didn't make enough progress, and that's happening constantly in the open source world. And I think a lot of open source developers are thinking of it as, I like coding, and I, we can collaborate on coding, and that's fun. And that's the sort of people who are doing it in their spare time. Otherwise, there's the back end thing of open source software that's serving the needs of big corporations to make 
that do the things that they do in the back end, and then they make proprietary stuff that restricts everybody and advertises at them. So we're trying to build a system that's exclusively for free and open projects and cultural projects as well as, uh, as, well as technology and software and things like that. Uh, but I want to see more people like me be involved in open source. And so the things that I think we need to do to make that happen, we need to have things like you have to simply actually deal with people, which is I can't build a technology that does this. There is nothing that those people could have done that would have gotten me involved. If, the, if Task Coach had been a better program uh, that was a beautiful UI right away, I would have just used it. I wouldn't have actually thought, oh, uh, you know, I'm going to get involved and become a developer of Task Coach. I would have just been happy with the program. And yet, it's not that I want it to be crappy and need me to work on it. What I want is to have it serve the needs of people like me. And I think the only way to get there is what I experienced, where I emailed these developers and they actually personally responded to me. And my feeling was that was insane. How are they having any time to deal with individual people? Because they're supposed to be developers. And like, don't you need a support team? And well, that's the answer. We need to have people who are non-technical deal with answering people's questions and supporting people. There's things that people like me can do, which is dealing with sorting all the feature requests. So people come in and ask questions. And I go, that quest, that's already been requested. And I close that feature request. But I point them to the other thing and make them feel like they've been heard. And that means the programmers can keep programming. And that's extremely valuable. And it is the main thing that's going to get people involved. Because the truth is, uh, when you get people involved and you give them a title and you say, I'm a developer of Task Coach, then people take that seriously. And there's lots of ways that you can do to actually get more people involved. The thing that my students were most impressed by when I tried to get them to use Linux wasn't how great it was or how much musical things they could do with it. It was that it didn't have ads. And uh, it was that it had certain values. And we talked about community. And that I could say, hey, the guy who makes my computer system and lives in Portugal, I know him personally. Look, I can go on IRC and say hi, and he'll respond. And to my students who were maybe not all necessarily technically inclined, that was the most impressive thing they could hear. It was like you would be an Apple user and you know Steve Jobs and you can go talk to him. It's a totally different relationship. And the personal human relationships are what matter and what drive people to actually participate, not the technology. So I think the building the community and the politics matters. We have to talk about how we want to build a society that's not built on advertising or spying on everybody that actually serves people's interests. And those are the things that drive people to actually be patient with something with an ugly UI or something that you have to use the command line and do some weird thing that doesn't make any sense to you and it takes a long time before you get used to it. But if you understand that this is part of a community and you relate to the people involved and you have a place in it that's not, hey, you can learn to code. That's not the message that I want. If we have more coders, we just have the same thing, but you know, more code. I want to see more people who are non-coders actually involved. And so there's a general level of engaging with people and taking that on and understanding that. Be patient with people. You know, and the more people we have who are non-coders who are involved, the more empathy there will be for their position, and the more they will be able to encourage more people to join. So, with that said, uh, my website, wolftune.com, has more about all of the copyright stuff and a bunch of other things. And I teach private music lessons still. And here's my email. And snowdrift.coop is the site I'm now spending most of my time on. And I would love to hear questions and thoughts from anybody else about any of this. Thank you. <laughs>